Hey everybody, this is Perch. I'm here with Joe. How you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Perch. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, we have the great pleasure to talk to uh, to Marco Lopez here. Marco, how are you? Good, good, good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, right out the gate, I just wanted to say congratulations. You have a new project up, and I think it it just kicked off. Is that right? Yeah, it kicked off. I think it was around today. I think it might have been twelve one one of those. I don't remember when. But today's just been a blur of a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> but yeah, it's, yes. it's, it's, uh, it's off to a good start. It is. Yeah. It is. And um, and and we'll put the so right away. If you're watching this uh, video on YouTube, the link should be on the screen. If you're looking at it on another platform, look in the description. You get the links to all the stuff we're talking about. And you can click right in there to to check that out. But uh, this project is called the Nightcrawlers, and you're doing this with uh, Rachel Disler. Is that am I saying yes. it correct? Okay, perfect. Yes. I have a reputation for terrible pronunciation of names. So tell us about this project. What What is it? Uh, the Nightcrawlers is in all ages, um, supernatural, you know, story in, you know, the vein of like Monster Squad, Goonie, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm 41, you know, it's here soon. And, you know, I'm a kid of the 80s, you know, so I'm a huge fan of the whole Spielberg, you know, dynamic, um, Don Bluth. You know, and all that. I grew up on all of that. Um, and films that really, film that really touched on, or stories that really touched on, you know, a bit of the darkness that exists in the world, mm -hmm. you know, but where the kids overcome, you know, you know, the day. And the whole thing with the Nightcrawlers was wanting to do something similar in that vein for kids, something in which, you know, um, it's basically from my love of horror and the idea that I had a while back, I was like, you know, every time in horror movies, you know, it's generally the final girl, you know, who always survives, defeats the slasher, defeats, you know, the monster. And I was like, what if there was a group of people that survived all these different horrific monster slashers, things like that? And what if they came together to make sure this never happened to anybody else? But then I was like, well, what if instead of the adults, what if it was a group of kids who were made orphans by these different supernatural events. And oh, they wow. end up in this orphanage with, that's run by this Christopher Lee type who used to be, you know, in all these hammer horror type films, you know, back in the day. And he runs this orphanage. And these kids decide to come together to form this group called the Nightcrawlers to, you know, make sure this doesn't happen. What happened to them doesn't happen to any other, you know, again. Um, so it's a little, it. when you, when you look at it like that, it also has a little bit of, uh, inspiration from X-Men because growing up I was a huge X-Men fan, you know, kid, teenager, mm. young adult and all that. So, you know, the idea of a school and run by an older individual and, you know, a bunch of teens, you know, but in this case, kids coming together, you know, and all that. Um, so yeah, so the idea is they take on their first kid, kid at their school, um, Hispanic kid. He thinks his parents, you know, have been replaced by doppelgangers who are werewolves. Um, and then during the investigation of trying to help him out, they run across this bounty hunter that's after these werewolves that it basically they find out was a previous night crawler. And the idea that the name they came up with, this whole thing that they thought they were being original of being kids, you know, to, you know, having this group to, you know, take on monsters and make sure another hat doesn't happen to kids, that it's not so original. And the mystery yeah. of how they came upon that name and why they were kind of nudged in the direction of forming a new Nightcrawlers is that's part of the whole plot and twist and turn of the story. You know, there's this whole mythology that me and Rachel built that, you know, goes back decades. And if, you know, the first volume is successful, it's stuff we'll explore, we'll explore in volume two and three and stuff like that. We have multiple volumes in mind, but that's it in a nutshell. It's basically, if you love Spielberg, you know, Don Bluth, Goonies, Monster Squad, smash all that stuff together and you get the Nightcrawl. All right. Yeah. I um, You said a lot of things that we could go into all sorts of different directions from here. But uh, the first thing uh, I, I want to touch on is what's your favorite Don Bluth film? Uh, favorite one? It's Secret of Nim. Oh, um, that's a great choice. You yeah. know, well, I, I, I thought you were going to go with Rockadoodle. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny Secret thing about that movie is I loved that movie when i was younger when i was like a kid and then probably to about 11 or whatever and then i remember as an adult watching it one day thinking like yeah that movie was great and i watched it and i was like the beginning of that movie is great 
once it gets into all the other stuff, you're like, yeah, it's all right. It's not really like, you know, yeah. one of my favorites of Don. Like, I feel like he had like a yeah. great, when he went on his own, he had a great run of movies. Mm -hmm. And then it got to a point where, like, he just ended up doing movies in which the studios kept interfering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I probably had a similar uh, arc with uh, Rockadoodle because, like, I, I'm 36, so I was a real little when that movie came out. You know, like six or seven. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with you there. And I actually rewatched uh, Secret Nymph, uh, God, like earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's just it's yeah. so good. It's, it's, it's so good. Oh yeah, I yeah, love that you're. It yeah, does, it does. I love that you're drawing on the, on kind of that inspiration. So I, as an observation, and I don't say it to knock other other people's projects, but when a lot of people say uh, you know YA or all ages, I don't think they're they actually produce. Why they, they seem confused about what that means. You pick up the book and it it doesn't feel for the kids. But what you describe the influences of what you're going for definitely hits the right notes. If, if you're drawing from Spielberg, if you're drawing from Goonies, if you're drawing from Bluth, those are the films that, that people got really excited about in the eighties. And that is the right inspiration. And, and I guess that leads me to the question. Why, why, uh, why do you want to aim at, at all ages? What, what was it about that market that you said, I want to write for them? Um, you know, I was looking at, like, I always, always growing up, I was a kid, of course, as a kid, but even when I became a teenager, and an adult, I always loved those type of stories, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, you know, mm -hmm. um, Chronicles of Prydane, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, those type of stories, you know, um, Sword in the Stone and all that from the Camelot Quartet, you know, those type of stories were basically pushes in a way, the sort of stories that pushed the boundaries of what, you know, what was based, once called family entertainment, you know, kids films, right. the idea of pushing the, the edge of G or P. Um, you know, and then, you know, I always like to say that they, those type of stories always, you know, they didn't talk down to kids, you know? Right. Um, and it was always like, yeah, it was always showing kids, yeah, the world's full of darkness, you know, some messed up stuff, but you can overcome it, you know? And, you know, that's it. And for, you know, the graphic novel market as, you know, the comic book market, you know, um, when I started seeing that, you know, all ages stuff was picking up and the YA stuff was picking up and that's becoming a huge part of the industry. I was like, oh, I was like, you know, what I've been doing in comic books, I was like, that's something that Eric can finally explore. And I've seen the stuff they're putting out in those areas. It's good stuff. And I like it, you know, but I felt that there wasn't a lot of it that was pushing that edge like those, you know, stories back then you know, pushed or stories and let's say pros have pushed, you know, and, and, and kids books and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I haven't seen every, looked at every, you know, all ages, you know, book for kids, but from a lot of them that I've, seen, you know, it hasn't really, you know, pushed that edge um, of the idea of like, here's a little bit of darkness, you know, it's been more, a little more stuff that, you know, deals with emotions, which is cool or stuff that's a little more happy, friendly, you know, and I'm a big fan of stuff like Bone, Jeff Smith, you mm -hmm. know, um, and, you know, I wanted, you know, just something that basically was different. Like, you know, I was used to my film mentor when I was, you know, studying under him for like writing and stuff that, that film, he would always say, when everyone's going right, you go left, you know, don't follow the leader. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Do different, you know? And so I was seeing this space that I felt wasn't being explored and that there should be more of and i was just looking at it from idea of like if i was a kid today i would want more stories like this so there's got to be kids out there today yeah. who are thinking ah I wish stories that were like this you know and that's mm -hmm. why i wanted to invent yeah. something like the night crawlers that would be for those kids out there that are looking for this i yeah. think it's a big market I, I mean i think we keep seeing little lessons uh either whether it was dc's uh primer that came out uh, what last year which has done incredibly well but you see the books that do what you're saying yeah. where they they aim it at that audience. They don't try and sugarcoat the darkness. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but just they give it a bit of an edge because kids are looking for a bit of an edge when they're they're reading these books. They're not looking for something completely sanitized. They want something that's going to push them a little bit, and they're bound, but but still be appropriate to that audience. So I think that's that's what I would do if I were in your shoes. So I'm glad that's what you did. That sounds that sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. I, I want to piggyback on another thing that you had mentioned, which is either going to win you over with everyone listening or it's going to sink the whole thing. So <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're grew up being an X-Men fan and um, 
for you, and this is subjective, this is not like a universal or anything like that, for you, what is it that makes an X-Men comic work? Or like, what is it about the X-Men that you mm -hmm. feel resonates with everyone because a lot of people have different answers so I'm, I'm just curious what it what about it resonated with you specifically and what about those stories do you think work i think when i first started falling in love with x-men as a kid i can still remember when i watched the uh the, the one where you know the australian x-men x-men pride of the x-men mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that animated like half hour like eight, you know that they did as a pilot for that never got turned into a show with X-Men, I think the appeal when I was a kid was this very, um, I think it was the flashy costumes. That was the appeal. You know, at first when you're a kid, you know, everything's visual, you know? So it was the mm -hmm. idea of like these cool characters, you know, the, the very cool attitude of the X-Men, you know? You know, the, they had the best costumes. They had the best characters. I mean, who didn't love Wolverine, you mm -hmm. know? And they just had this great appeal, this great visual appeal. I think as you get older, um, I think a big part of uh, the X-Men is appeal is this whole family of people that come from different backgrounds that are coming together to deal with this, you know, similar fate, um, similar circumstances, you know, and they're together, whether it's, you know, through, you know, Professor X or whether it's, you know, through some of the incidents, you know, and it all brings it together. And one of the things also that I don't think people realize what makes a good X-Men story, you really have to have that whole soap opera, you know, nature to it. You know, comic books are mm -hmm. soap opera. I'm not saying they have to be like soap operas, but, you know, yeah. superhero comics very much at their nature like soap opera, just like wrestling is like, you know, soap opera. You know, you have mm -hmm. to have that angle. And I think that's what made X-Men so appealing, you know, whether mm -hmm. you are a boy, a girl, you know, it's parent nature of this, this ongoing stuff, you know, the, these stories, these ongoing conflict, you know, that just suck you in like soap operas sucked in, you know, daytime viewers. Um, I think yeah. and, you know, the more older you get, I think, you know, a big appeal of X-Men is their cool, sexy characters, you know, like mm -hmm. Grant, like Grant mm -hmm. Morrison once said about the Wildcats, you know, he's like, you know, what made the Wildcats is so appealing. It's cool, sexy superheroes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that people loved about, the X Men. A friend of mine used to joke. He was like, he's like, why is it? He's like, why is anybody scared of, of the X Men? They're beautiful people by, by fighting, um, you know, bad guys. And you know, that's the that's the but that's the thing that you love that they're they're just these cool characters. Um, yeah. And I think at the core of it, you know, it's the family nature. You know, kind of like the Fantastic Four. For me, you know, good X-Men is like, I love when they're sitting around eating breakfast. You know, you have a scene where they're eating breakfast, you know, or they're playing baseball. And usually that's, that's you know, an opening to an issue. You know, after a big event happens, you know, you usually have, an, you know, the next issue after the event is over, whether it's a big crossover or big, you know, multi, you know, issue event, you know, the first thing that would happen the next day is they're having breakfast together, you know? Right. Uh, and the issue that takes place after that. Or they're playing a baseball game. That opens the issue, you know? So very much mm -hmm. for me, X-Men is very much about family um, and soap opera antics, you know, and cool characters, you know, if that yeah. makes any sense. No, absolutely. I think people misjudge the family aspect of it a lot. Um, it's at times. So, but I think that's, that's all part of the appeal. These, these, I mean, it's a team, but they operate as a family. There's these interpersonal dynamics. Like you said, they break up adventures with, with breakfast or a baseball game or something to, to basically remind you that there is this, this other dimension to these characters. But uh I, I um, I've got to ask you. So this, uh, just some logistics here. It's a um, this comic that you're putting out. It's available on Zoop. It's um, six by nine uh, digest from the art below. It's fully colored. It looks like, right? Yep. Yep. Cool. Uh, how? Yeah, it's a six by nine many... hardcover. What was that? Oh, sorry. We're, it's a little choppy. It's it's okay. Uh, please continue. <laughs> oh, it's a six by nine um hardcover probably about 100 um so the idea is each volume if the first one's successful each volume will be about the same um and mm -hmm. six by nine i think that was more in a blaze uh choice because i think that's the standard size for that you know that market when it comes to the you know all ages types book. so tell us about a blaze so what's it like working with uh with them what 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 made them the the good partner for the project um it's been great like uh well at blaze you know i love what because i'm a big fan of um 
European comics, and you know they put out a lot of you know you know comics from Europe. And, you know, I'm a big fan of that industry, and you know they put out manga, and you know they're currently you know going you know doing with us. You know we're their first, I believe, creator own U.S. creator own book, and we're their first you know crowdfunded book. And I just love everything they were doing, and I just figured you know let me see if they might be interested in you know publishing this book. Um, and it was simple as that. It was basically you know what their interest would be, and it's been great working with them. They're so incredibly supportive. Um, you know, uh, one of the editors that I was working with, you, you know, I, before when I was trying to get in at, um, dynamite and do some stuff there, you know, Kevin Kettner, um, and now he's with the blaze and they've just been, you know, very, you know, good people, great to work with a lot of fun. They, they care a lot about this project and the same thing can be said about Zoop, the platform, the people there, they're just, you know, there's your success is their success and they're just, you know, they're a partner with you. It's not like Kickstarter where, you know, it's basically Kickstarter's, Hey, you're on your own. You know, it's, it's totally different. Well, yeah. that, yeah. I, I know, I know Kevin as well. I, I, a similar situation. I've been talking with him when he was at dynamite and I kept talking to him when he was over at a blade. So are you working uh, directly with Kevin on this project or? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin's been involved for a lot, for, for a lot of it when we were getting everything set up for the, um, you know, we're getting, we're getting pages colored, you know, he brought the color, colorist, uh, uh, Klaus on board. And when we were, you know, getting, you know, every, you know, the cover together and stuff like that, like Kevin's been great. You know, as far as I know, I believe, um, you know, once the campaign closes and if it's all success, then Kevin will be involved on that end as well. We'll continue moving forward, getting the book together and stuff like that and the editing and all that stuff. So I'm super excited to work with him. He's a great guy. Awesome. Yeah. No, he is. It's a uh, it's a great price. I think for people who go in and check out the link, um, you basically there's a lot of like all campaigns. There's lots of different tiers. There's things you can get, but basically, if you want a, a printed version of this book, you're talking uh, sixteen dollars for a hundred pages color. That's a great deal. Yeah, yeah, that's the early bird deal, which I believe is the first forty eight hours. It's sixteen, and then after that, it's twenty. So okay. you know, for a hardcover book, you know, I, I still. Do- I think that's a great deal if you miss out on the early bird special and then you have to get the twenty dollar one that's still a great you know that's a fantastic deal given you know comic books and how much it costs to, <laughs> to make a comic you know and yeah. i think that's a fantastic deal and we have a lot of stuff on there like we have one of the rewards is a poster which is a schematic of the kids clubhouse because the kids have a clubhouse at the orphanage and it's just this crazy wild clubhouse that we're like, no orphan would have this clubhouse, but it's comics. So we're going to do what we want. So, <laughs> so it's just this big, wild, crazy clubhouse, which, again, is like, you know, their X-Mansion, you know, X-Men ex- <laughs> inspiration. Uh-huh. And it's where they do all their stuff and, you know, for, you know, where they have their gadgets and all these things, you know, for dealing with monsters and their meetings and all that. And so we're going to have a poster. Like, you'll see a, a sketch of it on there. Uh, Rachel hasn't finished it. But it's going to be this really nice poster that's basically a breakdown of the inside of the whole thing. And it's going to be like this awesome schematic, like, diagram. You know, like, blueprint diagram looking thing. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. No, I'm, I'm looking at the, the perks are very nice. That is a great price, I think, as everybody's getting, uh, feeling the pinch of comics getting more and more expensive. That's a good deal. And certainly with the holidays coming up, you know, certainly a nice thing to jump in on. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, well, actually, you know, two, two directions. First, I guess I, I must ask you about Rachel. So she's the artist for this book. And how was it yeah, like working yeah, with her? She's the artist and co-creator. Oh, it's great, man. 2017, 2016. I don't, I was probably like, I probably made a post on like digital webbing, pencil jack, some or DeviantArt or something. Like I forget, you know, back, you know, we'd be like, oh, you know, making posts, looking for an artist for a project. And she was one of them that responded and I loved her work. And basically we started talking and I was telling her about the idea, really loved it. And, you know, we started working on it together, but you know, it took this long to get to here just cause you know, life sometimes sidetrack, sidetracks you, you know, and then with oh, sure. that and then the pandemic and all that. Um, so, but she's been awesome to work with. She's fantastic. You know, comics, like I always say, you know, because I originally came from art, an art background, comics is, you know, it's a visual medium. The artist does, you know, most of the heavy lifting. And she's just been awesome. You know, her pages, when they come in, they're amazing. Her designs are awesome. And I think she really captures the spirit and the mood of what this is supposed to be and the characters. 
And I feel it's something that, you know, when you look at it, you really do get that idea of, you know, because she's around, I think, not the same, probably more, and I think in her mid-30s, she still, you know, knows that idea of the whole Don Bluth vibe and Spielberg element. And I really do feel she captures that in her artwork. And a little bit of that, you know, because especially if you look at the cover, that cover was very, like, Scooby-Doo inspired because I love Scooby-Doo. Um, oh, for sure. And, you know, so that cover, we basically were looking at basically, like, a lot of as to, you know, make that cover an inspiration of, the, of all that. But yeah, she's just great to work with. I consider her a friend and I hope we get to do, you know, volumes of the Nightcrawlers for a long time. No, it, it, it looks like a great collaboration. I mean, again, the art style fits. I, I have two daughters, uh, certainly who love comics, but they love, uh, they, they're very particular about what they'll pick up and they wouldn't. And they would pick up this. I mean, they would look at it. They, they would easily oh, be gravitated I, to this. You just kind of can tell. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about some of the other stuff you've done uh, just because I know there's a decent segment of people who watch uh, the channel who are certainly into wrestling and looking at some things that you've done in the past. So you have a whole luchador uh, set of comics that, that's in your background to tell how, tell how, how, uh, how, tell us about that. Uh, yeah. I uh, love wrestling. I have, you know, I've always watched wrestling. So I was an adult. I was watching wrestling for years and then not watching it for a while and then watching it again. And a good friend of mine, Ivan Plaza, he runs Cheeto Comics, a small press, uh, you know, publisher. And he had, you know, joined for a licensing company called Mass Republic, which works with luchadors like Rey Mysterio, Tina Ellis Jr., nice. you know, Solar and Astro and, you know, Conan and such. And um, they had the idea of doing this whole, like, shared universe you know very sci-fi fantasy horror you know luchadors you know kind of like you know superheroes jack kirby stanley type thing you know bigger than life so you know i came on board i mean i've been you know we co-created this whole universe with the idea that these one we did like five one shots and for me they were like they're one shots but for me they were kind of like issue zeros you know and mm -hmm. they basically each have these little bits and pieces that connect to each other but they're their own stories and the idea is they would lead to this you know shared universe of action adventure sci-fi fantasy horror luchador stories you know bigger than life stuff and they got collected into a hardcover and softcover graphic novel the issues sold well they were sold a lot online at wrestling shows mm -hmm. you know through wrestle crate and stuff like that um, there were some comic stories that carried them. Uh, they didn't have diamond distribution, but they did, you know, really well. The, the trade sold well. And the whole idea was going to be that, you know, we're done with those. Then we'll move on to do a series of mini series, but that wasn't in the cards. The, you know, not to get the licensor just felt like going in a different direction. Um, sure. and they didn't want to pursue that anymore. So it ended with just the five one shots and the collected trade. But it came from our love of, you know, wrestling and our love of, the, like, the Santo team and those old luchador movies where the luchadors were playing themselves yeah. in the movies and yeah. they'd be fighting, you know, horror monsters, Frankenstein's creature, Wolfman, stuff like that. And it was like, yeah. what would that look like, like today? Like, with the inspiration of this generation, you know, stuff that's inspired by anime and, you know, old and new superhero comics. Like, how would you do a 21st century version? Of and that's what we did with the Luchaverse was our basic like, oh, this is what a 21st century version would look like. And it did it did well. And we got like creators were nice and nice enough, like Mark Wade, Mark Russell, Brian Edward Hill, Justin Jordan, Jamal Eichel, um, Devin Grace, and a lot of creators were nice enough to, you know, read the Wait. issues and give us quotes if they liked it. Um, so nice. that was awesome to awesome. get like, you know, pros in the business to say good things. And it was pretty successful and it was a lot of fun. Um, would love to do more. Um, in that area, you know, down the line. And there's been talks with different people about ex exploring this in different avenues. Um, not, you know, those characters, but, you know, all different luchadors or different, you know, wrestlers. But we had a lot of fun doing it. We got to get to yeah. the Guerreros, you know, and, and Psychosis. There's there's more characters to, to get into here. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, speaking yeah. of, um, you know, having those those kind of names be, you know, reading your stuff, you contributed to uh, the Puerto Rico Strong Anthology, and that had a yes. lot of uh, uh, big names in that as well. So so what was it like uh, being involved in, you know, Puerto Rico Strong? Um, It was great. The... That project, what happened, so 2017, when the second hurricane was about to hit um, Puerto Rico, yeah. 
I hit up my friend Derek and I said, Hey, let's do something to help. You know, he's Puerto Rican also. I was like, we should do something to help Puerto Rico. And like, we know comics. I mean, and there we can do something with comics to help Puerto Rico. So he was like, I'm in. So then I hit up Desiree, who was an editor at that time when it was just Lion Forge Comics before they merged with Only yep. Press. And I, and I told her the idea and she said, yeah, let's do that. And then, you know, I talked, you know, because I had done some work in 2015, 2016 with Lion Forge Comics. Um, and I hit up, you know, one of the owners there, Carl, and I said, hey, you're thinking about... And he was interested. Desiree, you know, on her end, because she was working for them, had talked to them about it. I had already been at that point reaching out to some pros and saying, hey, you know, this is where you're interested. And, you know, people were starting to come on board. And then once Lion Forge, you know, internally talked about it and they're like, yeah, let's do this. Then they brought in, you know, Hazel as an editor who was working for them at the time. And then me and Derek brought in, you know, uh, Neil, who was a friend of ours. And so then we were off to the races and then we literally put that anthology together by going out to like Desiree had a list of, you know, Latinx, you know, talent that she thought would be good to involve, you know, writers, artists, you know, I contacted other creators, you know, and like Fabian Icieza. And um, we literally did that whole thing in like, I think three to four months from beginning wow. to end. It was the craziest three to four months ever. <laughs> and because the book is like over 200 i think about 200 pages or over 200 pages yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it is not something i would ever want to attempt again <laughs> again oh mm -hmm. it was a yeah. wild time it was a lot of fun but it was like yeah. some days were just like i wanted to pull my hair out <laughs> but you all won the eisner that uh in you 2018 did. for it right yeah, which it came out in 20 and we got the award in 2019 and okay. everybody but me knew the book was going to get nominated and that we were going to win. I had no, I was just like, look, it's cool that we did this and we were able to mm -hmm. help Puerto Rico because, you know, all the money from that went to charity and it was awesome. But I was like, we're not going to get nominated. Then we got nominated. And I was like, oh, okay. Then I was like, we're not going to win. Yeah. And then Desiree went to, she was at San Diego. And so she also went to the award show. Mm -hmm. Me, Derek and Neil and Hazel didn't. And me, Derek and Neil were on, in our little chat group talking and then also looking at the Twitter updates. And then when Ooh. ours came up and they said we won, it was like all of time slowed down. And I was like, oh crap, we just won an Eisner. And it like, yeah, was the most ridiculous. It was the most ridiculous and fun, you know, experience, but it was also very like, it was still even like a day later when it happened, I was like, there's no way this really happened, right? Because I was just like, this is impossible. But everybody but me knew it was going to happen. I guess I was the only one who was like, no, that's never going to happen. Yeah, well, because you guys are up against uh, where we live, that like image anthology, I, I think, from J.H. Williams III was like also another benefit anthology. And like, so, so I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I can imagine people not being sure and being like, oh, well, I don't know who's going to win based on like the kind of stuff that was up. But, it was you know. a strong year. It was a very, yeah. there's a lot of very strong contenders out there, but I mean, I, I the project is great. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a really nice anthology. It, um, it doesn't feel like it's a, it's a chopped up um, of, uh, you know, a bunch of stories that don't necessarily fit together. It feels like one volume. It's, it's, I, I, I enjoyed it immensely. I think it's a great yeah. book. Um, so congratulations there. Like like Joe yeah. said, you beat out some pretty big competition and it was for a very good cause. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, it was like, yeah, there was incredible competition in that an an anthology um, spot. Like I still couldn't believe some of the, uh, that out. like they, they put out incredible work. Um, and yeah, and that was, you know, you know, how, you know, the fact that we, everything we put in there gelled so well, because we kind of went with a mandate of, you know, the beginning of wanting one, have the stories in there cover certain topics. You know, we didn't ask that of everybody, mm -hmm. but we just had this idea of like, oh, it would cover, you know, these type of topics. And then also our other mandate was to kind of make the book something that could also double as something educational. Um, mm -hmm. and then the other mandate was if some of the, you know, some of the stories to be personal, you know, to have a personal touch, you know, whether there was somebody telling a story from their past or somebody telling a story that was personal to them, um, in this nature of Puerto Rican culture or, you know, social, political, or of what's going on with the, you know, the hurricanes, you know, over there. Um, and I think that's what really helped the idea of, we were like, you know, this, this, and this, 
And that really helped to make it all gel together and make it feel like one piece, you know, multiple stories being told in that piece. It, it um, I, I'm not going to, I probably won't describe this the best way, but it, it, the, the story, the book feels like you're reading stories, reading accounts. It doesn't feel like you're being lectured to, if that, if that makes any sense, it doesn't feel like a, um, yeah, it doesn't yeah. feel like you're reading a TED talk. It feels like you're reading a comic and that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was, that, yeah, no, yeah, that, that's how we, we wanted it to be. We wanted it to be very, you know, like, we didn't want it to, uh, something that was preachy. We wanted it to be where, you know, because I'm a big thing that when, for me, when you're talking about issues, I feel in the story, you shouldn't be like you're on a soapbox, you know, mm -hmm. preaching to people. You should get what they're talking about through the story, through the characters. You know, if your yeah. story comes off like you're on a soapbox, you know, preaching out there in the uh and basically in the you know in the in the little uh town center preaching you know to the people then it's very very it's going to come off very boring because it's going to come off like issues 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 and you're just going to sit there like what is this story about what are these characters doing now if you weave your thoughts and ideas through your story and your characters then people it's, still, it's basically what i say it's the old twilight, the old twilight zone you know, you know, it talks about issues, it touches on stuff, and but when you're watching it, you're watching a fun like story about aliens, and then you realize, oh crap, there's actually, a, you know, um, well, and I think that's it, it, you know, with a lot of the stories in there, we did that exactly, I, and I think it loops back to kind of the the book you have uh, here now, the Nightcrawlers, and how you're describing that, setting that up, with the influences being um, a lot of the you know the Spielberg stuff. I mean, those those movies definitely they're entertainment. The kids are, are involving, but there's also a background message of, of family or support or getting through a tough time. I mean, that is in the story, but they entertain you while they're doing it. So I, 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 I'm glad that that's what you're bringing to comics. And I, I think that that's if you're going to try and land with an all ages group, you have to you have to be able to entertain through a good story and have your message kind of woven through it. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. I I, uh, I want to make sure people are are certainly looking at this. Um, you know the pitch here. Uh, yeah, it is an all ages book, but it is truly all ages. I mean, if you you describe, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of the '80s films and Spielberg. Obviously, I'm I'm now taking my kids through them, and but I'm I'm still enjoying going back and rewatching these. Adults are going to enjoy this book too, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a big a big thing for all ages. Should always be something that. Whether you're 80 or 80, enjoy it. Ooh. I don't like all ages material. You know, there's a lot of things like there's, there's family entertainment and there's kids entertainment. And I think, you know, Ooh. this shouldn't be separate. It should all be synonymous. Like when you make stuff that's just for kids that only kids can enjoy and a parent has to sit there rolling their eyes, being like, is this movie over? Because I love my kid, but God, this movie is horrible. You know, it should be something that everyone enjoys. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that I feel from comics a little. Like, you know, I like the idea when, you know, comics got away from the comics, but I also, Ooh. the idea of like, you could pick up, up an X-Men book and if you're eight or 80, you could read it, you know, now that you have a rating system in comics, and a lot of publishers, I think it's, for me at least personally, it seems to stifle some of the stuff because, you know, there's some stuff in there that's now that you're reading like books, you know, from Marvel and DC and you're just like, that, why is that in there? They're like, and not to be... I'm not, not talking about prudish stuff. But I'm just talking about stuff that's just like, that's probably not something level of violence you probably show an eight year old, you know? Yeah, yeah I'm so glad you're bringing this up. It's, uh, this is such a, like, uh, I, I feel like it's something that needs to be, like, discussed more and that we need to sort of change the system right now because it went from, you know, being a little looser to now. And I mean, this is very literal. You go look up some books and they're like, it's for ages eight to 11. And you're like, what? Like, <laughs> why are we, what are we doing here that we're, we're making such narrow stuff. And then you, it keeps getting more and more ingrained. Like now why yeah, you, you hear more of a push for like, oh, this is middle grade. This is younger, middle grade, older, middle grade, younger YA, older YA. And, and it's like, but what about, it, it, it feels like we're moving away from telling a good story and more to editorial and publisher oversight and then making decisions on what's like appropriate for a six-year-old versus seven-year-old and making these sort of like arbitrary cutoff. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, uh, I think one of the things of growing up 
as a kid is when you got to read these, you know, the you know books back in the 80s and 90s, you know, X-Men, Batman, stuff like that. Um, I think there's things, it's basically like the, and, and a perfect example I like to use is like the Animaniacs. When you watch the Animaniacs as a kid, there's stuff you don't pick up on. Then as an adult, you watch it, you're like, wait, what was that again? Mm -hmm. And you can't believe that they got away with that. But what the writers understood was kids aren't going to pick up on certain things. They're just going to laugh at certain things that they think is funny and other stuff. They're going to laugh at the character's humor, you know, so they'll laugh at it, but they won't really get the joke. But as the adults in the room will get the joke. And I think that's what comics used to have was, you know, an eight year old reading a comic book for it, them. It means one thing and they enjoy it for that reason. But the, you know, 40 year old or 30 or 20 year old reading that comic gets it for a different reason. And I do agree that when you narrow down, you say 11 and it's to eight, or this is, you know, 13 to 17, you're kind of narrowing down, like, why can't stuff that maybe at 13 they don't get, but when they become a read that, they'll get it, you know? Because that just makes yeah. the work, you know, it makes it readable again. It makes them want to keep, you know, reading it again. It makes them find, you know, different things in there that they didn't see. Um, and it also, yeah. I think it helps with, you know, growing up, you know what I mean? There should be stuff that should be a little tough in those stories, you know, that, you know, kids should be dealing with or should be care having seen characters like Spider-Man or what's gonna call it dealing with, you know, that, you know, stuff like that, that, you know, so that they'll be able to read and that won't be like, sorry, you have to be 13 to read this because now it's a little violent because it's 13. So PG-13 so we can get away with stuff, you know, that we couldn't get away with before. Um, you know, so yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, comics, there really should be, I've all, and I've always wondered the same thing. I'm like, why is we not having a conversation about like, you know, putting everything into this box of age groups and, you know, and this idea that like, you know, no, kids should just read these comics now, not these comics anymore. And I mean, I, I, in a way, I think it's a little de detrimental to the industry and might be part of the reason as to why, you know, they shrunk a little more and shrunk a little more as time went on before, like, you know, the graphic novel market started, you know, exploding and becoming, you know, more of the thing that was, you know, expanding in the industry. I completely agree with you. And I think that um, it, it becomes more of, of, of making a list rather than making a story in some cases where you're, you're trying to nail down this very specific group. And I think it, it stems from a, a strange place of, uh, hey, we've got to, you know, we've got to grow the audience. We've got to get new people in. We, we need to get kids reading comics again. I know. Let's make a comic for ages six to seven girls who live in the Pacific Northwest and have an interest in math. It's like, whoa, what, what are you doing? You're, you're, <laughs> you're narrowing the market so severely that your odds of hitting that market are almost impossible. It's going to not feel authentic. And I do think that's why Scholastic and Manga in many cases are being so successful because they're not thinking that way. They're just thinking, yeah. here's a giant audience, put content out. And, and I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a strange place a comic industry finds itself in. Yeah, I think the industry is a very... It's in a weird flux right now as to where the comics, you know, 20 years from now. And I think right now what we're seeing is a very mutation of the industry, you know, web comics, digital comics, print mm -hmm. comics, the old traditional direct market, the new market that's opened up by, you know, people like Scholastic, Random House and, you know, stuff like that, you know, doing all these, you know, uh, graphic novels and stuff like that. And I think the industry that we see, the what the industry that was in the 80s is not the industry that's today. And the industry that we see today is going to be hugely, vastly different than the indie, you know, 30 years from now. And it's going to be in interesting to see where it truly goes. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and I think that's also why webcomic companies are, you know, like Line and Webtoon and Top of their just like, like Manga, you know, a lot of companies, you know, they deal with, you know, that you know, audience in Korea and, you know, Japan and all that, they're just out there telling, you know, popular genre stories, um, and then just letting the audience come to them instead of, you know, trying right. to say like, we have you, we have what you want here. They're just letting them find them. And I think that's the better case. Like, you know, and the night callers, yeah, it's a bunch of different kids from different backgrounds, you know, um, a large group of them are minorities and, you know, but they're, and they're dealing with, you know, monsters and stuff like that. But, you know, the idea is it's just these, you know, at the core, it's something that anybody from any background can understand or get or feel, uh, you know, and there are little things that we touch on here and there, but the story to make it, you know, most appealing. 
And I'm all, you know, I'm hugely all for, you know, diversity, talking about it and stuff like that. Um, uh, but I think, you know, it should always be, you know, I always say like character first, you know, story mm -hmm. second, you know, and then what you want to say, if you have something to say, you know, then you say that third because it weaves well through the story and it gives you something that's going to appeal to a broader base. And maybe even some people in that broader base take something from it and be like, huh, I never looked at life that way. I never looked at these issues that way. And now I am. It, it's uh, when I look at the sample pages and kind of look over your project, um, you get the vibe of what you described. It's it's kids. I, I like how you got the the big splash of the of the treehouse. I mean, again, if you're trying to appeal to kids, what are they going to be appealed to? They're going to be appealed to some action, some adventure, some little bit of mystery, a little bit of danger. Really cool treehouse, like the X Men's Danger Room. You just you check the list, and you do. Of course, when you look at the cast of characters, it does look like a very diverse group, but you don't have little thought bubbles or or dialogue groups or you know dialogue boxes going. Hey, this is a very diverse group of children. Look at how diverse it is. You don't need to do that because the kids are just in the comic having the adventures and, and you're just enjoying the adventure. And that's that's the far better way. I mean, that's again, that's to your point, that's how the X-Men did it. The X-Men was an extremely diverse group of, of a team, but Chris Claremont wasn't in there going, hey, check out how diverse all the characters were. It was just, they were just there having great adventures and having a good time and it worked. Yeah, yeah. That's like one of the things that, um, you know, that me and other friends talk about that are creators, whether it's in comics or film, is that, you know, we're like, hey, it's all, you know, to talk about issues. And it is. There's nothing wrong about that. But sure, sure. I think the best way, the best way change people's minds or to create change in the industry is, you know, I want to see, you know, Latinx characters, African-American characters, Asian characters being in a cool sci-fi movie or a cool action, cool horror film, you know? Those genres yep. that I love or more, you know, something it's like, I rather, you know, I rather see that, you know, you put more of those type of films out and then that'll just become the norm to people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And people will start sure. realizing like, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is just the norm. This is just the way it is. And in a way, kind of like when you just do those type of movies with positive portrayals, where they're not stereotypes, then people, you know, will be like, oh, they're just like us, you know? But exactly. In a exactly. sci fi movie or action film or horror movie running from Slasher. I mean, why shouldn't I, I get you use, we keep going back to the Goonies because it does have this feel to it. But I mean, why wouldn't, uh, you know, a wide range of kids from all different backgrounds, why wouldn't they want, if, if they're going to want to see themselves in the Goonies, they're going to want to, they're, they're just going to want to have a fun show. They're not going to want, again, we've used this word, a lecture. They're going to want to have a good adventure. <laughs> if they have a good adventure, they're happy. That's, anyway, I, I I mean to get us all off topic, but this project looks great. I I, I, I love what I see here. I think it's uh, it's a great value for, for the amount of pages in the book. I love that you're, you're doing this. I'm still stunned that it's been more than a year that Primer has been out that has kind of almost owned this market from a main, I mean, it's, it's sat at the top of the Amazon charts, beating out Watchmen and other things. And this book looks like it's taken a run at that same audience. And I think that's excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I hope it's success. Everything's looking good on the Keen so far for the, I mean, the point I haven't done it the first day. Um, but my hope, you know, I know once the book is successful in the campaign and, the, and everything gets fulfilled and then it's going to go out and storm in the comic shops, you know, and stuff like that. Like, Blaze has all these different plans, um, you know, so I hope it becomes a big success, especially, you know, the library market and stuff like that. And I hope it becomes this big success because I have literally at the top of my head, I think when I pitched it, I think I said, you know, oh, if it's a success, well, here's the idea for volume two, volume three, and I think I said volume four. But in my head, I have, like, up to volume eight, and then I also have an idea that goes – back into the past like we could do prequel books that deal with the past night crawlers you know when you know all that stuff gets revealed as to how would how was their past group and you know all that stuff like there's so much material for this you know series that you know i would love to do this from years for years to come i don't know if i have an end in sight um you know there's something <laughs> that when you read the sure. it's either the first volume or the second volume there's something you're going to read that you're going to find out where a group of kids that we have, like the X-Men, might not be, you know, 
for every certain amount of volumes. And again, that's another, you know, oh. X-Men influence that just gets weaved through my brain without even thinking about it because I read too much X-Men. Um, <laughs> you know, like X-Men always well, changed. You always had this core set of characters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but, that's uh, awesome. yeah. I, um, I love that that's your influence. That's definitely the right place to go. And uh, no, you're, you're on the way. I mean, like I said, we're, we're recording this on the first day. You're almost a 10th of the way through it already. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's off to a great start. Um, 30 days left. That means around December 10th. So you've got until December 10th. If you're listening to this, yeah, make sure you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get over there. Get, I mean, go early. Don't be one of those people who waits the last minute and then wonders what, what went wrong. So get, get in there. Yeah. And let's get this funded. I want to see lots of projects with you with this. I'm glad I'm, this is the first ablaze crowdfunding book. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it is. And, um, and, and also just to be clear for everyone who, who's listening, you, you have tons of ideas for what else to do, but people that are backing this project, they are getting a complete story. Yeah, it's like a police story, beginning, middle, and they'll just be like, what I, it's kind of like when you read, you know, old comic books, except in this case in the term, in a term of graphic novels, where you would read an issue and you would get a complete story, but then certain elements would get picked up, you know, in further issues. So in the same way here, you, you know, the graphic novel has a complete story, beginning, middle, and end, but there's going to be certain elements that'll, you know, go, you know, will get picked up in the second volume and we'll get picked up in the third volume and so on and so forth. But each volume will have a beginning, middle and satisfying, but there'll be like soap opera elements like X-Men again, that'll yeah. get basically, you know, drifted into the next volumes. Great. Well, I, I wish you all the success. Marco, is there anything else our audience should know uh, before we sign off here? Just I, uh, obviously the link you're seeing in this video, you're seeing in the description, please go check it out. I'll have some other links to, uh, other volumes, if you're interested in the Luchador work, there's uh, the Comixology link you'll see down there as well. Of course, Puerto Rico Strong, you can get on Amazon and, and many places. But uh, Marco, uh, thank you so much for the time here today. And and I, I, I definitely wish you success in this book. I want it to do really well. I'm, I'll, I'll back it myself, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of what you're trying to do here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh... So everybody, you know, please check it out. You know, like I said, we have stories to tell, you know, from here on out. You know, hopefully we're successful. I think we know how day one is going so far. And just know that this comes from a place of love of not only comics, but of, you know, horror and, of you know, like the stuff I mentioned, you know, Don Bluth, Spielberg, you know, fan of animation, you know, kid storytelling, all ages, books that can be read by anybody. And it's just going to be a really fun series that we think everybody will be able to enjoy and, you know, just, you know, give it, everyone, give it a check out it, you know, across social media. You can find me on Twitter at Atomic Rex ENT um, on Facebook. Just, you know, type in, you know, Marco Lopez, you'll see the banner for Nightcrawlers above my, you know, picture. And that's all social media I do because I really don't care for social media. So I can't do anything <laughs> beyond you. that or I might go crazy. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yep. Agree entirely with that plan. Yes, please. Uh, there will be all the links below, but give Marco a follow and uh, definitely some great work. Marco, thanks again. And, and, uh, and looking forward to seeing a successful campaign. We'll want to have you back on when this is all said and done. Talk to you about the experience. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks.